Okay, so uh, welcome to, to our audience, to our listeners. Welcome to my fellow uh, panelists and uh, welcome to this discussion around digital transformation uh, in, in education. Uh, my name is, is Stuart Watts. Um, I'm the Vice President of uh, the Europe, Middle East and Africa region for, for D2L and I'll be your host today. Um, I, I've been at D2L just over six years and have had the pleasure and, and the privilege of, of steering D2L's growth in, in, in the region. And I've, I've worked in the higher education space for just over 11 years in, in total. Um, I just want to take 60 seconds or so to introduce D2L, and then I'll ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves as well. Uh, so, so D2L, for those who don't know, is a, uh, a founder-led uh, education and technology company based out of a little place called Kitchener uh, in Ontario, Canada, and is one of the, D2L is one of the, the sort of big four uh, LMS companies. Our Brightspace learning innovation platform is in use at over 1,400 institutions and organizations globally, including many universities in the European um, Middle East and Africa region, and including the, the institutions that our panelists uh, represent today. And we're, we're very, very proud to have supported and be supporting our customers and our partners as, as they've embarked on their digital transformation journeys in more recent years. So I'm going to hand over to, perhaps we can start with you, Ellen, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, your role, and a little bit about your institution. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dr. Ellen Buck, Director of Learning and Teaching at the University of Suffolk. Um, I've been with the University of Suffolk um, since before it became the University of Suffolk in 2016, um, and was part of uh, its journey to uh, achieving deg degree awarding powers for our taught provision. Um, we really pride ourselves on being third in the country for widening participation and increasing access to higher education. Uh, the university was established very much to raise aspiration in terms of education and career and progression in the eastern region. Um, and we are now, uh, as I say, third in the country. We're based in Ipswich, um, but we now have an international population uh, of just over 14 and a half thousand students. Cool, thank you, Ellen. I'll come to Michelle next, I think. Thank you, Stuart. I'm Michelle Olmsted. I'm the director for the Center for Innovation at Leiden University. Leiden has about 33, 34,000 students. It's a research university, and we are in the midst of a massive digital transformation like all of the rest of us, I think. Um, and the pandemic has certainly been a disruptor in, in many ways, positive and negative for that process. Thank you, Michelle and Felix. Okay, I'm Felix Kuipers. I'm uh, working at Avans University of Applied Sciences um, in the Netherlands. We are in four cities in the south of the Netherlands, Breda, Roosendaal, Tilburg and uh, Zichtorenbos. We have something like 37,000 students and still growing. And um, I'm yeah, working myself for seven years at Avans, the first three years as a, a lecturer. And since four years now, I'm working as program manager for the digital transformation. So that uh, is at Avans uh, university wide. Everything we do is university wide. And this includes uh, yeah, uh, an LMS, but also a student information system. Uh, planning, rostering, so everything that is digital in education, uh, we are yeah, trying to combine and, and, and do. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. So um, as we said, we're here today to talk about digital transformation. It's happening all around the globe in higher education, the, the wider public sector and in the private sector too. Um, certainly as a, uh, a learning innovation platform provider, <clears throat> it goes without saying that D2L has a, a very keen interest in, in understanding the progress being made, the obstacles, the challenges, opinions on whether digital transformation is an entirely positive thing or not. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we, we, we recently undertook a, uh, a study or a survey at D2L of over 5,000 higher education professionals globally. And that was across Latin America, Asia, um, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Europe as well uh, on that subject. And, and I'm sure some of our panelists um, also took part in that, um, that, that white paper, that, that piece of work that we did. It was very interesting to see the differences uh, in responses across regions, but also some of the synergies as well. So I'll just start by giving a little summary of some of the things we took away from, from that survey, which should lead us nicely into the, the conversation that we're going to have today. 
I think overall, there is, there is very little doubt that there's been a recognition that digital transformation is necessary and is generally uh, a positive thing. Um, one of the stats that stood out for me was that 81% of the, the folks surveyed in the UK felt that uh, online technology enhances the quality of higher education. Uh, opinions on technology have improved overall, I think it's fair to say, and um, folks see the benefits more than they did pre-pandemic. Uh, the use of digital tools, I think it's fair to say, is only going to increase. Uh, in the UK and the Netherlands or the Benelux region, the focus is moving forward, seem to be fairly similar as well, based on the results of, of, of this piece of work. So things like enhancing online provisions, which, which makes a lot of sense given where we started and where we are today. Uh, modernization of digital infrastructure to, 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 to better support those online provisions. And also investing in staff digital skills, um, particularly in the UK, was a big, big focus uh, for, for universities moving forward. The, the survey also highlighted why uh, people thought that digital transformation was, was necessary. You know, what were the end goals, the drivers? And, and some of these things that came out were things like improving course quality, enhancing student experience, and interestingly, uh, competitiveness, which I think is absolutely key. And universities are now focusing more and more on uh, their digital offerings, their online or, or, or hybrid or blended offering, offerings to remain competitive. In the UK, we learned that around 48% of respondents um, had a staff digital skills initiative in place, which is, which is very interesting. And I'm sure we can talk more about that as we, as we move through the day. So uh, those are just a few of the interesting insights and stats to, to kick us off. Uh, for those interested, the full report is going to be available to download and details, I think, will be provided uh, at the end of this session. But with that, let's, let's get into to the discussion uh, today. And we do hope that the next 50 minutes or so will provide the audience with some, some perspective on you know, how digital transformation programs are progressing in higher education, how digital transformation can improve learning for students, and how ed tech can also be a force, force for good. So um, Ellen, let's, let's start with, with you, if that's okay. I wondered if you might, at a, at a you know, fairly high level, describe what does digital transformation mean to you and, and, and where do you believe the University of Suffolk is in, in that journey? I think it's fair to say that the pandemic has been an absolute game changer. Um, and it's really provided um, me, I guess, as the, as the strategic lead for learning and teaching to really advance how we are doing our learning and teaching, how we're designing our learning and teaching, um, and how we can increase the kind of student-centeredness of our learning and teaching, if you like. Um, the whole the whole sector had a mass lift and shift um, in, into into an online state. We did exactly the same thing when we went into the pandemic, um, and I think what was really interesting for us was how it's forced us to rethink things like student engagement and student participation, um, where learning is taking place, um, and starting to have conversations around designing for learning kind of between the gaps so that we're not talking about learning on campus or in, in our online learning environment we're talking about you know learning in all of those different places mm. so, so digital transformation then became about removing barriers to participation um, increasing flexibility for participation um, really enabling our students to manage and juggle their lives while still being able to do exactly what us, us as an institution was, was set up to do, to, to give them access to higher education. I think where we are is um, learning and teaching. We've got our platforms pretty much you know, where we want them to be. We've integrated new things. We've, we've trained our colleagues. We're developing that, that kind of skill set and confidence. In terms of the campus itself, um, we are really starting to think about what do our educational spaces feel like? What do they support? How do we enable people to be in them in different ways? Um, and that's work that's ongoing. And we've got some fantastic new provisions coming through in our kind of health and wellbeing quarter where we're really starting to, to pilot, to champion, to change, to see what that feels like. In terms of Suffolk as a region, um, there are huge pockets of, of, of poverty as well as huge areas of, of, of kind of wealth. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a complete contradiction. And with that goes challenges in terms of infrastructure um, and therefore the skill set and the access to, to the digital skills and, and equipment that people need. So for us as a community institution that wants to impact change, we're considering all of those things in digital transformation. And I think we're in different places in all of them. 
Interesting. Let, let's move over to um, our friends in the Netherlands. So um, may, maybe Michelle, do you want to do you want to chip in next on that in terms of Absolutely. where you are in your di digital transformation journey? Yeah? Yes, I think I can also build a little bit on what Ellen was saying. Um, but for the digital transformation, we are working a lot with culture change. Leiden University is one of the oldest in Europe. Um, that comes with its own challenges. The pandemic has helped us validate a lot of the innovations and digitization that we wanted to do prior to the pandemic and had started planning for, but the pandemic spoke for us in a lot of ways. Um, instead of doing further and longer piloting. Um, so I also think the student-centered role. Um, for me, I've worked in online education for 20 years in different areas of the world, but for the Netherlands, it's thoughtful uh, pro progress and it's about responsibility in the data and student-centered well-being. Um, and what I notice in the progression, which we'll talk about later, is the community aspect that maybe was neglected in the very early years of innovating in digital ways with online learning. And then I think that the culture change moves into digital skills, as you mentioned, how to assess students in the modern way and include uh, digital skill models that work for the entire organization, not just for students or just for professors and the financial modeling. So, we are, I did say massive digital change, but all of these things are part of that holistic approach, which really boils down to culture change in our higher mm. education. The things that I focus on are inclusiveness and how to make sure that um, we can provide things in a way that provide student choice in their learning process. Uh, so that's augment and, and virtual reality, or if they like to focus on text, that's also available. So multiple multimedia and other methods of offering those mm. skills and, and those methods. So that's a little bit about where we are, but we also have a good collaboration with other universities in the Netherlands through organizations that are offered to talk about the problems we have and the digital skills we need. Great. Okay. Thank you. And, and Felix, do you want to? finish that one off for us? Yes, of course, and sort of built on that because uh, it looks like uh, all universities are in the same arena and, and, and doing the same, same kind of things. Um, uh, maybe a bit different angle, huh? so we have digital transformation, but we have an educational transformation that is the basis for what we are doing, so we want to, uh, to make able for our students to uh, choose modules, eh? so we are dividing all our educations in modules of, of uh, 15 uh, credits, so 10 weeks of education, and, and the students, we have something like uh, uh, 100 different educations, students have to be able to choose from all uh, areas of the university and, and so uh, making this uh, modules uh, uh, is, is kind of the core of our uh, uh, education transformation and uh, making sure that uh, the, the students are able to choose these modules and we can plan that and uh, the modules build like Lego blocks on each other hey? of course uh, you have to make sure um, that are we also supporting. So, uh, uh, um, so that, that is, I think, on our side, uh, and, 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 uh, our big steps. And next to the educational and, and uh, digital transformation, we have an organizational uh, and cultural uh, uh, um, change management uh, 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 transfer because yeah, you have to work with uh, uh, teacher design teams and, and uh, self-supporting teams. And, and so uh, this also means a lot for the people and for the skills and, 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 and the culture in the university. So these three kind of uh, transformations, we are yeah, juggling to uh, uh, let them together uh, uh, continue. So lots of change across the board. I think it's fair to say lots of lots of things to carefully consider. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, how universities could 
can better engage students using digital tools. There's obviously been a, a whole host of new digital tools thrust upon our, our, our stake, key stakeholder groups here, so staff, academics, students. How, how do we think that universities can better engage with students using digital uh, tools? And, and how important do you think it is to use technology to support different types of learners? I think uh, maybe we'll come back to Ellen because I think you touched on a little bit of this in your, in your previous answer. So do you mind taking that one first again? No, that's fine, Stuart, thank you. Um, I think what, we, what we've discovered is that digital tools absolutely in, in, you know, and as you talked about in the introduction, digital tools are there and they're enhancing um, learning and teaching, they're enhancing the experience. Um, they are, I mean, we're using them as, as part of a new pedagogy, so as, as well as kind of moving everything online, we've moved to a, a, block, a block pedagogy as, as a result of the pandemic. So we're now using Block and Blend. Um, and what we've asked course teams to do is really think about everything they're doing in terms of what are the learning outcomes? Um, what are the best ways of enabling students to engage with these and to enable students to, to engage with active problem-based social learning um, mm. and to really help them develop those skills that, that kind of enhance communication and therefore start to lead to better graduate futures um, and graduate outcomes. So we're using technology as part of that because, you know, what we found ourselves, and if we think back to the beginning of the pandemic, we suddenly found ourselves having to do meetings like this um, and nobody kind of knew how they worked. Um, and now we're putting students in that situation and asking them to engage in learning in that way. What are the skill sets that they need to do that? Um, how are we getting them to think it differently and to be able to respond differently in these spaces? How does that line them up for the future? Um, we're using a whole host of things, whether it's virtual classrooms, whether it's padlets, whether it's multiple choice questioning, how, and how do we use those in terms of assessment, formative assessment? Um, mm. It's building confidence, it's building skills, um, it's increasing flexibility, it's increasing, the, um, it's increasing engagement, and it's increasing enjoyment because it becomes more creative, it becomes more innovative. I'm just going to um, just go a little bit off piece because I'm sure that everybody listening to this is interested in your shift to, to, to a block and blend uh, model here. How, how, do, how have you seen the have you seen that? Has it been a success for the for the university? What, what are some of the results that you've seen so far? So, well, we, we piloted it last academic year within a couple of our schools, within our business school and our social sciences and humanities schools um, across the, the modules. We've evaluated probably about half of those modules now, looking mm -hmm. at engagement, looking at achievement, uh, looking at experience for our students and our staff. Um, staff have really recognised the need to, to redesign from the ground up. You can't just lift a semesterized model and squish it into a block. It doesn't yeah. work. Um, we tried. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work from a student experience or a teaching perspective. Um, we've also talked to our students who have found that they really enjoy being able to focus on one thing at a time, to be able to deep dive, to be able to feel that they're building their confidence, their knowledge, and they can see how they're progressing through the academic year. Mm -hmm. um, and for some of our students who might be mature returning to, to education or you know, haven't got a, a family context of higher education, it's scary. So let's help them, let's build those skills, let's, let's establish that, that solid level, and we're seeing that come through. We've seen engagement increase. We've seen students going back, you know, from module three back to module one to revisit their learning. We've seen them being able to, to attend lectures online or seminars online where previously they were trying to get the kids to school or go to work or what it was they were trying to do. Um, and we've seen a 10% increase across uh, our modules in terms of achievement for, for our students. So we're seeing grades go up um, as well. Um, and, and the quality therefore is, 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 is improving. So it's great for us. Fantastic. Great story. F Felix, let's let's come to you next. So same sort of question, you know, how, how do you think universities can better engage students with digital tools and uh, maybe, you know, an emphasis on how important you think it is that technology is used to support different learners, different backgrounds, etc.? Um, yeah, the, the, uh, uh, putting the, the student central uh, is, is, of course, essential. And, and there are many, many kinds of flexibility. Yeah? So a student mm -hmm. uh, can, uh, can be flexible in time or place or location or whatever. Yeah? And, and he has to be able to follow uh, the, the, his, his education in the way he wants. And he want, has to be able to learn the way he wants. And um, uh, we are trying to make all these different kinds of uh, flexibility uh, possible. Mm -hmm. And we are, 
I, I don't know how big the blocks uh, are that Alan mentioned. Um, we are uh, creating the modules of uh, 15 credits, eh, so 10 weeks. So we are looking, can we uh, also have for the same learning goals, create different uh, modules with the same uh, goals, but different ways in which the, the uh, education can be followed by the students. So uh, in this way, we, we uh, try to uh, embed you know, flexibility in uh, the, the way the students uh, mm. want to, to, to learn. So that's, that's the way we look at it. We are, uh, I think, two years on our way in creating these modules. So the first modules uh, have been uh, given by the by the uh, first academy, uh, or, or part-time academy is that. We have not um, the, the experience as far as Alan mentioned, so we still have uh, a few years to go, I think. Cool. And Michelle, anything to add to that one? I would just say a couple of things that we've found very successful in this. One is building communities of students. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a student platform that provides input on future discussions and choices for tooling. Mm -hmm. uh, we also oh, had brought in student moderators, maybe week two of the pandemic, who helped teachers in the online and blended and hybrid facilitation of teaching. And they, they taught us so much about what they want. Mm -hmm. And also this choice model of how do they want to come into campus when it's open? Um, mm -hmm. do, do some of them want to stay at home? And does it have to be live or can it be in, in time when they want it? So these things have really helped, but I think the two biggest things that I can add to already uh, discussed items is building communities online and in person. Uh, we have mm -hmm. a mentor and tutor process, but also getting student input in the classroom with the teacher during course production and pedagogy and um, in the classroom might mean they're facilitating online with the tools that we have or recommending new things for teachers uh, because they, we have a big teaching school. So we have a lot of students that can cross over and help teachers with an expertise in didactics. Uh, so this has really helped us, but I, I would also mimic what Ellen and Felix have said about student choice and ways that we can be inclusive for for all of our different types of students and student mm. needs. I, that, that's really useful. I'm, I'm gonna ask a question that's come in from, from the audience at, at this point. So um, Jason is asking, what about the levels of engagement in hybrid classrooms? Are the tools used really fit for purpose where that is concerned? I don't know who wants to, to take a shot okay. at that one. Yeah, I'm carry on, Michelle. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, hybrid is difficult for all of us to, to offer at a quality level. And I think that is why we put in place these students to help who really understand the technology and can help recommend better ways to do it. But I think hybrid is the hardest didactically and pedagogically to do well. And the tools are there. Do we understand the fullest functionality of the tools? No. And do we know exactly how the effectiveness is? We don't have the research, the confirmed research on that yet. So unfortunately, sometimes we have to make decisions mm. before the research is in. Yeah. Yeah. Same at Avance, we have the same experience. We do not know yet how effective it is. It's very difficult for the, for the teachers to uh, to do this to and, and, and to make uh, also the, the, the students at all the locations to involve them in discussions in the class is very difficult. So, so we are still yeah. in the experimenting phase. Ellen, anything that you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I think Michelle's absolutely right. We don't we don't know exactly how the technology is working. We don't have the research. We you know th there's lots of learning and hybrid is definitely difficult. Um, I think it also challenges how we understand engagement um, because you know there, there is this kind of idea that students get most out of a higher education experience by being on campus by being in the room be, by being part of that conversation you know live face to face mm -hmm. and I don't think we were at the stage yet of understanding that actually that might have shifted as a result of the pandemic um, mm -hmm. and and how do we make sure that we're fully engaging those who have chosen or need to be learning remotely and actually your, your idea Michelle around student moderators is really interesting in that regard yeah 
Good discussion. So let's sh just shifting gears slightly. So we, we, we have talked a little bit. We've started to touch on personalization of learning experiences. It's, you know, it's one of the key things that we read a lot about in university strategies or strategic plans or educational visions, wanting to provide that more personalized experience to students. At the same time, we're seeing a shift very much towards more collaborative, active group based pedagogies like problem based learning or challenge based learning. How, how do you think uh, collaboration can be used effectively in personalized learning programs? And again, how important is technology in delivering both of these things together? Maybe we start with you, Felix, on, on that one. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, you could use technology in, 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 in different ways, of course. Uh, uh, of course, learning is a social process. That, that had uh, the contact between the students and students and teacher is essential. and. Uh, you want to maximize, of course, that. So uh, what you now see now is that often students are, uh, when they are spending time at school, are sitting in a classroom, listening to, listening to uh, uh, a kind of knowledge transfer. And, and yeah, that's kind of waste of valuable uh, uh, on-site time. So if you we use tools to, to transfer the knowledge uh, when, when the student is in, on his own time or location or whatever, we can maximize the value of the uh, student time uh, on site. Eh? So that, that, that would be one way. Um, of course, yeah, you, you could uh, also uh, try and see if you can use the, the digital tools to, uh, to enhance the social process. Eh? So uh, uh, students of course, often are at uh, different locations, and you can use the, the tools to uh, in, in, to, to um, improve the quality of the collab collaboration. Eh? And, and, and you can use feedback tools and, and things like that to uh, make a, a, a more social process. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, these, these kind of uh, use of these digital tools we see, of course, there are many others, but yeah. Good. Uh, Michelle, any comments on that one? I think just going back to something we talked about earlier, and that is building community on and offline mm -hmm. uh, is a valuable tool we've discovered in its full capacity during the pandemic that can continue. And I think we all agree that activeness will be uh, enhanced by both online and digital tools and the in-person experience. So the, the biggest challenge I think we have is giving students choice. And sometimes they're gonna choose all online and sometimes they're gonna choose all in person to, depending on their personality, their current yeah. needs and facilitating both of those things in a way that builds community and, and enhances discussion and academic debate mm -hmm. has to use ed tech and digital tooling at its core in order to allow this transformation to be successful. Yeah, good. Uh, Ellen? Absolutely agree. Um, and I think for me, collaboration is also how, how do we use those communities to help students test their sense of self and, you know, mm. get an understanding of where their skills are. Um, so, you know, if you're using digital tools in a way that helps them build confidence, develop communication skills, um, develop those digital skills to be able to take into the big wide world, you're, you're giving them opportunities to personalise their learning in terms of this is a particular particular skill set that I really want to be able to develop. How can I use this tool and this opportunity to do it, which then puts some onus on us to make sure that we are really making it clear to our students why we're doing things in the way that we're doing. Um, and that mm. comes back to really considering them in terms of the design process, I think. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm going to jump back <clears throat> um, a step or two here just to ask another question that has come from from the audience. Uh, back to that initial theme of digital transformation, what is digital transformation? Um, so a, a couple of questions that are fairly similar uh, in, in their nature. Um, but two of our audience are asking, you know, digital transformation is a complex process and there is a belief that it, it shouldn't be something that's driven by itself. It shouldn't be digital transformation as a theme that's driving digital transformation. It should be the educational vision and strategy of the institution that drives uh, the digital transformation becomes part of that uh, vision. So the question is, did, did you elaborate, did, did any of your institutions elaborate on 
digital transformation as part of your institutional policies and strategies. Um, I, I don't know whether they've been redone uh, or done recently enough to, to answer that question, but I wonder whether anybody wants to, to have a crack at that. I know, Felix, you talked a little bit about how it was an, edu you know, an educational transformation as well as a digital transformation. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I think by what we were doing, eh, we had an educational uh, transformation and that needs a digital transformation. And what we learned is that... Um, uh, by uh, uh, choosing to uh, rebuild our, all our curricula to modules, um, we learned that the, the education development process is an essential process. We, uh, before we started, uh, we didn't see it as a process. And now we see it as the most important process of uh, our university. And, and mm. We, uh, we built tools ourselves uh, to uh, support that process. We are creating teacher design teams to, uh, to develop education. And we also see that the role of, of a teacher is changing from someone who is transferring knowledge or capabilities to someone who is developing uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, modules to developing education. So the development of education has become much more important. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, Ellen or, or Michelle, it, it, have you seen anything at the sort of institution level in, in the strategy and vision that's linked yeah, to this? Yeah, I, I think for us, we had an education vision that included digital skills and digital transformation from before the pandemic, but we've just mm -hmm. recently updated our university strategy to include it. And we are actually making organizational human resource type changes to our way of looking at didactics and digital didactics to bring that all more together. I think that Felix and Ellen both mentioned uh, teams of designers to help teachers and the, the role of teacher is changing. Not only are they a didactic and research expert, they're also having to design as a facilitator and coach. And that requires more of a village mindset to support that student teacher dynamic. And I do think that we are doing things both policy wise, but also in actual changes to who we work together with in the university and, and how do we provide that dynamic in the teacher student relationship. Yeah. So this, this is probably a good question to, to follow on from that one then. And may, maybe I'll, Ellen, I'll ask you to, to address this one first. So um, how do you feel that universities um, can encourage and support the adoption of, of tools to deliver a really you know, flexible top class um, blended or even fully online in, in some um, situations experience? And can you share some examples from your institutions of, of how you've tried to do this? It's challenging mm. um, because there's a certain comfort in, in, you know, the campus is open, let's go back and let's just, let's, let's do what we were doing before because we're, we're comfortable there, we're confident there. Um, yeah. And it has been really challenging, I think, to, to, to kind of fight that mindset. Um, we've, as I said, you know, when we were talking about block and blend, we've seen such um, changes in terms of engagement and satisfaction and experience and we you know there's still lots we need to understand we don't have the answers to all of it um, and so I think that the best way we've been able to do it is, is use our student voice listen to our student voice contextualize it within the sector um, research that's coming through so some of the stuff that was coming through Pearson Wonky um, even you know even going back to the Barber report these these pieces of evidence were, were including research from across the, the sector in the UK how do we contextualize Suffolk within that? How do we make our student voice loud and clear? One of the key things our students said was lecture capture, please, can we keep it? We love it, you know, and it's not just about not having to come onto campus. It's about being able to re-engage, to revisit, to revise, to check learning. And therefore we're giving them more ownership of their learning at the same time. Mm. So that, that has been, yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that's come through for us. Um, and we just need to keep going back to our students and, and helping our course teams understand why we're asking them to do what we're asking them to do, giving them the evidence, showing the impact and the mm. benefit, and then giving them the skills and support to, 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 to achieve it. 
And what about on the academic side um, as well in terms of supporting them in use of, of new technologies? One of the questions that, again, we've just had from, from the audience here is, you know, how do we deal with the overload felt by teachers um, at, within the university and everything that they have to carry out now and the use of these, these tools? And I, I know just from you know prior conversations that the University of Suffolk have, have done a lot of work around enabling that the academic community yeah. so would you t touch on that for us for a second? Certainly yeah um, so within uh, weeks of, of the pandemic um, my learning design team had created the first of a number of modules that we're calling DigiPath modules um, and there are six or seven of them focusing on different elements of learning. The first one is very much focusing on um, understanding Brightspace, understanding the potentials of the skill set within Brightspace, which is our online learning environment, um, understanding how you can use it to deliver problem based learning, um, how you ensure that there's consistency, you know, the kind of the nuts and bolts of it, if you like. And the second one then starts to look into much more around the kind of how you use it to enhance your pedagogic practice, how you use it to en enhance engagement and experience. We've asked all of our academics to do this and we are seeing, you know, you can see where, they, where they've really, you know, taken, taken this on board and, and seize the opportunities that come with it. However, if we want our academics to be doing the instructional design properly with due consideration to inclusivity and diversity and equity, just having the skills and just having done the course does not give them the time to do it. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I've been really fortunate to be supported in here um, by our executive team is increasing our digital learning team. Um, and we've brought in three new learning designers over the last academic year. Um, we had additional resource put in through the pandemic. And through that, we can then say, you know, if you've got a particular module, a particular activity you're struggling with, come and talk to us. We're doing mm. module health checks to understand what can we do to better support the development and enhancement of this. Um, and we've brought in a student experience team who are working between students and academics to mm. understand what are the challenges, what are the opportunities and where can the learning design team step in to help. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, really good stuff uh, going on at the University of Suffolk. Um, Michelle or Felix, would you like to come in on that one about how your institutions have, have you know, tried to encourage and support adoption of, of tools? Yeah, we, we uh, at Advance, we already had a, a kind of course like Ellen is mentioning. Yeah? So we were already teaching all the, all the teachers the digital skills uh, and, and all the tools we have. We also had in place a team of 70, uh, we, we call them ICTO coaches, that is ICT in education coaches, which mm -hmm. are hands-on working with the, uh, uh, in, in the academies, uh, with the teachers uh, to learn them and, and uh, uh, help them in practical sense. Um, but what we also are doing is we, we uh, have all university have all different kinds of tools and, and using all these different kinds of tools also takes a lot of uh, uh, skills and effort from the teachers to learn all that. So we are integrating all, the, all these tools. We, are, uh, use experience. we have a team of uh, integration specialists to integrate all them. We have a team of uh, user experience uh, uh, people to make it as user friendly and, and uh, uh, easy to use as possible. So that also helps in, uh, in, in the workload of the teachers. So all kind of stuff they uh, first had to do by hand is now digitized. So that takes a bit of the load of the teachers away. Yeah, I would Michelle? add to Felix that um, we also have, you know, these teams have been more valuable in interacting directly with teachers. But I also think that as part of our process, we looked at professional development of teachers. How do we adapt the professional development of teachers and give them time? Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing that is a burden on teachers and professors is their time. Yeah. And so we are now looking at that as part of the professional development evaluation. How do we give teachers more time? How do we allow them to teach maybe less and share the load of teaching with other professors or experts so that they have time to learn and really move in this digital transformation without adding extra workload. We didn't necessarily accomplish that in the pandemic, but mm. we feel like we're sort of exiting now the, the core of what happened in this two-year process and really trying to find time for them yeah. and, and more team support. Yeah. yeah, maybe a final sentence on this is that 
uh, at Avance, we see the, 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 the training and education of the teachers to be able to, uh, to, to do this as uh, the critical path of our ent entire uh, digital transformation, ed educational transformation. That, this is the most difficult part for us. Yeah, okay. Um, we, we've, we, I think we've kind of touched on uh, the, the next question a little bit as we've just uh, finished answering the previous question, but I do want to ask it because I think there are a number of answers to this one. Um, what challenges do we think persist when delivering digital transformation across universities and, and how can we help overcome uh, these? So uh, maybe we'll start with Michelle uh, on that one. Sure, thanks, Stuart. I think there's two things that we already touched on. The skills gap that we have in this journey is, is huge for not just professors and teachers, but for staff. And, and the transformation that has to be done there is cultural as well. Um, and I would also say the data responsibility around this and the skepticism, although maybe has been diminished, is coming up again and again. How mm -hmm. do we approach things responsibility in responsible ways with student dialogue so that they know what they've consented to when they enter university? And how do they deal with that when they leave um, in, the, in the world that they are moving into, there is a, a knowledge you have to have about data that we have never had to teach in the past. So how are we preparing the students and ourselves to be able to explain critical thinking in a new way uh, when we have AI to do some of it for us? So I think those are the skills gaps and skepticism that are still prevalent despite this disruptive pandemic that has helped us along. Uh, Felix? Um, yeah, and uh, another uh, uh, issue we have is that uh, to make our uh, education flexible, eh, to, to make it possible for the student uh, to, to make these choices, we have to standardize a lot of processes and tools and systems and that is never a an, an, an popular subject to talk about but you really have to do that of course because it's it's touching the autonomy of, of an education or an academy or of, of a teacher and and uh, yeah we have to standardize to make all these uh, have to digitize all these basic processes so this is also a complex discussion to take everybody uh, on our uh, digital transformation journey. And Ellen? Got a number for you, Stuart, I think. Yeah. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I think digital skills gap, absolutely. Um, and for me, there's something there about how do we know what is working? Um, how do we get, how do we find where the data is that we need? How do we capture it? How do we use it to inform what we're doing? Um, we've got, we talked about building communities, but actually the pandemic and digital transition, transformation is in some ways, is that disconnecting communities or relocating them in ways that we haven't quite worked out how to connect them back up. Um, we've got massive premiums on digital information and price hikes that are going on left, right and centre in relation to some of those things. The, we've got digital poverty, um, we've got challenges with infrastructure, cyber security, mm -hmm hot potato right now you know competing products how, how are all of those things how are we wrangling all of those things to mm. ensure that none of it is touching our students or that we are supporting them to be able to engage in the way that works for them and how are we ensuring our staff have got the confidence to do it they all impact in some way shape or form and we're having to rethink all of it I think yeah I couldn't agree more and I, and I what, one thing I would add to that as as a sort of technology um, provider and vendor is you know, we have a, a responsibility to try and make sure that all of these different technologies, these different tools that we are, you know, that, as I said earlier, have been thrust upon us now. And, you know, there'll be many more to come are seamlessly integrated and interwoven so that the experience for your users isn't, you know, a broken one. Um, so that's that's one other thing I would add to that. Um, I'm going to um, shift to a couple of questions from, from the audience here. So I'm going to try and read these out. I've not had time to read these, so forgive me if this doesn't come across in the way it's supposed to. Um, have you seen an uplift of student engagement or a, or a backslide during 
the last couple of years as we've transitioned to more blended, hybrid, or even fully online um, experiences? I think to start with, we saw um, a decline in engagement. And I think the, and, I, and I, that's not just true for Suffolk, I've heard other institutions in the UK talking about it. And there was this kind of idea that students were disappearing because they didn't like online. Um, mm. And we lost sight of the fact that actually maybe they were disappearing because they didn't have enough kit at home or they didn't have the infrastructure at home or they were suddenly having to deal with a whole host of other stuff. Um, yeah. So I think that's where we were to start with. What we're now seeing is, is, is a different kind of behaviour and students engaging in different ways, um, but we are seeing it go, going back up as a result of that kind of flexibility that, that digital's given us. Yeah. Any other opinions or answers to that one? Yeah, but what, what was kind of funny to see at the when uh, uh, during the pandemic, the students were allowed to come back to university uh, campus again. Um, they didn't come uh, back to the university to, to learn something, but they came back to socialize and to talk to each other and to work together. And he said, uh, when I, I'm at home in the evening, then I'm going to follow the online course. <laughs> so, so that's uh, kind of the, the other way around. Okay. Yeah, I I'll, would I'll... agree. I think yeah, that Karen. it's also um, about the, the student deciding for themselves now. And before they didn't have a choice, it was on campus or it was online and there was no flexibility. So I think that flexibility has to stay. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a rather direct question. I know how I would answer this, but I, I guess that the, the, the audience are more interested in, in, in how you guys would answer this. What, if anything, do you think are the benefits of learning management systems? <laughs> Should I Don't all shout at one? once. <laughs> uh, well, I can maybe say because um, the learning management system, we migrated to Brightspace during the pandemic. And I think that the learning management system, as we talked about earlier in the standardization is vital. Even if there are other functionalities with other devices like Teams or Zoom, the integration into a learning management system helps everyone. Yeah. Um, and it manages that choice for students as well. So part of that management system allows students the flexibility to choose and it allows students to use additional tools that can be integrated either by offer through the LMS, in our case, Brightspace, or a, by a link to another uh, facility like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or other kinds of um, processes. But it manages the learning and it gives ability to make choices and flexibilization in the course. Yeah. Yeah, the same at at advance. We we uh, did it also during uh, the pandemic that we. Uh, 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 changed our uh, LMS and, and uh, using it to the full potential and integrating it in with all other tools uh, we have, uh, that is uh, uh, essential for us. That is, that is uh, also essential for the students so that they can at one location do uh, everything they want to do and, and learn from one place. So, so um, uh, that's also our, our experience. I think I think I would add it's it's given learning a home, if you like. So in the pandemic, before the pandemic, it was campus, then it was fully online. But we want to have that mixed hybrid blended world. So actually, the, the LMS is giving learning a home. It's giving the whole learning experience a home. Um, and I think it's also giving us and enabling us to get that data, which is which is really important to help us understand how are our students engaging, what are their learning behaviours, and, and how do we build on that information to do it better. I like that slogan, Ellen. I've written that down and I'll be passing that across to our marketing team after this discussion IP, today. IP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Giving learning a home. Excellent. Um, it's slightly, so I just, I just want to, this is a really interesting question and, and kind of sums up a lot of what we've, we've talked about uh, during the sort of 50 minutes uh, today. Much of the progress that, that we've seen over the last couple of years where digital transformation is concerned has been uh, driven or at least expedited by, by the pandemic and, and what's happened over the last couple of years. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on which of the key developments and lessons learned from the last couple of years do you think are here to stay? Um, 
and which are in danger of falling by the wayside as we move back towards more of a, an on-campus experience for our students. Um, and I think that that same question has been asked by a couple of people in the audience as well. So um, who wants to, to take that one first? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, we learned that uh, what we are doing uh, is in our field, we, we, we are at the right direction, the right path. Uh, so uh, integrating everything. But what, we, what, what I didn't touch on yet is that we are using a lot of uh, ad tech tools, but we decided to, uh, to uh, develop software ourselves. To, had to make able this uh, education catalog in which we put all the modules and where the students like a kind of web shop can uh, select the module they want to do and so that we, we build that ourselves. And uh, for us that is essential to uh, put all the uh, education development process and all other processes exactly the way that we wanted. And, and of course we integrate all the edtech tools uh, into uh, what we are building and, and for us this is uh, the right path so we, we, we started this some three years ago and we are now uh, fully uh, um, yeah, uh, yeah, developing this path and um, what we learned uh, what is not uh, uh, the, the, the right focus is uh, and, and, and we see that a lot is a focus on the digital tools itself without looking how to use it? What does it do for in, in the process? And and what does it mean for the for the uh, teachers and so on? So you really always have to look at the education processes, and after that, only after that, uh, uh, looking for digital tools and what they can uh, can mean. Yeah, here, here, Ellen. Absolutely, I think one of the really important things for me is that I can hear my colleagues talking about how they're designing their learning, mm. what, who they're designing the learning for, um, and why we want students to learn it in the way that we want them to learn it. Um, mm. And that absolutely resonates with, with Felix's point there. It's not about using technology because I can, it's about using it because it's going to be effective in helping students achieve what I want them to be able to achieve, um, to be able to get you know, the, the qualifications at the end of it. We've got to retain flexibility. Um, I really don't want to go back into a, you know, I'm on campus and therefore Brightspace becomes a, a holding pen for some slides. I don't mm. want that to happen anymore. It's got to be integral to the learning process. Mm. Um, and I'd like to see us getting to a point where we don't talk about blended learning being in Brightspace or on campus, but we talk about blended learning being learning that happens across spaces um, mm. and, and within spaces as opposed to in, in, in kind of a silo environment, if you like. So conversations around how much blend should I have? I'm not going to tell you. It's it's mm. about what's right for that module, the delivery time, the, the students, the activities, all of that. And that's what I want to retain as part of this, because that's that's the excitement, the exciting piece of education, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's And it comes back to that that word design, isn't it? It's learning by design, not by chance. And yeah. yeah. And Michelle? I would say two things. As an innovator and the director of an innovation center, I really love the pace of validation that we had in the pandemic. Mm. Being realistic, I know we're going to lose some of that pace. And I think it's a good thing because we need to evaluate and see what is effective and efficient. Um, well, but I will miss it. <laughs> what was the what, what do you think was the key reason for for that, Michelle, with the sort of almost a removal of some of the bureaucracy that, that goes on in decision making? Was it just that universities felt they had to move quicker make decisions yeah. quicker yeah yeah I think the pressure from the government down about changes you know sometimes our rules changed every week so we eliminated some hierarchy we brought uh, interdisciplinary teams together that maybe never worked together before and that made the process faster and some of those have now gone um, because there are crisis teams that come together for a purpose and now we sort of miss some of those people now but I think we've learned we have to reach out um, to those people again but I also I do think it was just based on a need and and we do have to stop and reevaluate. but I would love to still continue to learn from those multidisciplinary teams 
And I think Ellen and Felix both said about the flexibility. We cannot lose the flexibility in the learning process for this student journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some great points there. Um, I'm going to maybe, I think this will, might be our last question, but I'm again turning to the to the audience uh, questions here. There have been lots of questions, so I apologize that we've, we're not going to be able to get through them all here. One, one of the points that somebody in the audience has made is that it appears that the experiences that we're sharing today are standalone institutional experiences based on your own universities. And the question is, have you leveraged exist or how have you leveraged existing university partnerships on the digital and education transformation? Have you worked with, with partners? Um, maybe Felix, you're nodding. Maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I, I think it's a very good question and, and, and we have been discussing this uh, quite many times and of course we have a lot of contact with other universities and what you'll see is that almost all universities have the kind of same ambition. They all want to personalize, flexibilize uh, education and uh, together with the work field and so on. So the ambition is the same. But what we see is that the, the, uh, uh, the way it is implemented in university is different. Every, everywhere is different. And, 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 uh, and it's almost impossible, I, I think, to, to uh, uh, collaborate in a way that you are building together. Eh? So uh, we, we sometimes uh, think at advance, if we build our landscape and integrate it and and we can make it available for everybody because then all students could work mm. with it. But, but in, in some way, it doesn't work that way. So we all want the same and we are very uh, limited, able to work together. Okay, any other perspectives on that one? Maybe I could build a little bit on that because we, we have an acceleration plan in the Netherlands as part of SERP, mm -hmm. which is a, an organization that brings together services for um, universities, applied science and research universities. And as part of that plan, there was a tech version, a committee on it. And we found some of what Felix is saying now difficult. Some of us were able to build things together and also purchase ed tech together, which is very helpful. And I think that there are also the Brightspace community in Europe that really helps share best practices. So I think some of those communities during the pandemic really came together to help. And we could call individuals from other mm. universities to say, what did you do when you dealt with this? Um, but I think building integrations is what we were able to do, not building the actual product because it's the build versus buy question, but building integrations were successful in partnerships with Delft, for example, or mm. partnerships with SERP, which is our university collaboration for services and product purchases. Yeah, and I, 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 what I would say is <clears throat> I, I fully believe that institutions should lean on their technology vendor partners as well to facilitate that sort of thing. So Michelle mentioned there um, one example of community, but I, I think that you, you should demand more from um, from your vendor partners where that's concerned. Ellen, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, not so much in terms of the blend, but certainly when we were developing our block, um, we, mm. we were talking a lot with Victoria University in Melbourne. Absolutely mm. helpful. Couldn't couldn't have been more, more helpful and supportive mm. in helping us, you know, work out what we were doing, how and why. Um, but I think actually this is an area that I'd like to see our technology vendors helping us with more is 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 that collaboration how can we use use your communities or your connections to to deal with some of the challenges that we've got and that we talked about earlier you know because there's 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 so much synergy in some of the stuff we're talking about here yeah fantastic okay well I think we'll probably leave it there at this point. We've, I think we've got about a, a minute and a half to run and I don't know, ask another question and, and get cut off halfway through the answer. So I just wanna say thank you to, to Ellen, to Felix and Michelle, um, some really, really well thought out answers there. And hopefully uh, the, the folks in the audience have, have picked up some, some tidbits and some, um, some guidance there. And, and if, if nothing else, it's been a really interesting conversation on how digital transformation is progressing in higher education, uh, how you know, uh, it can improve learning for students and, and how ed tech can be a force for good. So 
thank you again to, to the panelists. Uh, I hope it was useful for everybody uh, listening and uh, we'll leave it there.